Gary Parrish. Welcome back to the CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting, dodo birds, and leaky black. Eye on College Basketball podcast is presented by FanDuel Sportsbook. FanDuel Sportsbook, make every moment more. Matt Norlander is here with me. If you watch it on YouTube, smash the like button like your Brandon Davies. You have consent. And if you haven't uh, yet subscribed to the CBS Sports College Basketball YouTube channel, please also do that while you're here. Let's get into it. So one night after Purdue and Houston both lost uh, road games to unranked opponents, Kansas and Tennessee uh, went out and did the same thing. Kansas lost at UCF. Tennessee lost at Mississippi State. So the teams that are ranked first, second, third, and fifth in this week's AP poll have all lost games on the road against unranked opponents over the past three days. Dead leg, first question for you. If you had an AP ballot and if you had to submit it right now for some reason, who would you rank number one in the country? I think this is two straight shows. We've started with the number one question. Am I right on that? I think so. I can't keep track. And well, let, and you know what? I don't blame you. You've been a busy, you've been a busy guy as of late. And, uh, you know, I, you're professional as always. GP comes ready. He's got me queued up for a question. I'm going to answer that question. I am. we got a big show today. A lot of stuff to get to. And the top of the polls have been uh, well, quite interesting. I can't wait to can't wait to ask him about that. But you look you look tired, dude. You look like you've been burning the candle at both ends. And I mean, right off the top, we just we need to address the elephant in the room, okay? And you may not be ready to talk about this publicly. I understand that, but you know, we've done this podcast together for about ten years, so we need to address the reports that are out there and the rumors that are flying. And I know you haven't done it yet, but earlier this week, Cole Adams reported, quote. My sources tell me Alabama has targeted CBS Sports personality Gary Parrish to become the next head coach. Sources say the deal will be finalized tomorrow morning. The Crimson Tide have found their successor for legendary head coach Nick Saban. Uh, so my question for you, and we are going to get to the number one poll. You know, who should be number one? We're going to get to all that. But I think in fairness to our audience, I need to ask you, what the hell are you doing here? And why aren't you in Tuscaloosa right now? I'm not going to coach football. I've never coached football. Okay. Do we know what is that? Do you have any idea what this thing is about, by the way? I had about five people send it to me earlier this week. I I, I saw it. I, I I don't know. Okay. There's a lot of stuff on the internet, you know? You can find whatever you're looking for, it's out there. Well, Cole Adams, I don't know who you are. I don't know what that was about, but it gave me my biggest laugh of the entire week. And I couldn't start the podcast without at least addressing it. So you're you're here to declare. You're sticking with the pod. You're not You're not going to succeed Nick Saban at Alabama. No, I'm loyal to CBS Sports and the Ion College Basketball Podcast. This I'm where I'm where I I'm where I want to be. Okay. I'm where I belong. The 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 grass is not always greener. I, I, I think another coach already used that line this week, right? I think that was Dan Lanning. <laughs> I think Dan Lanning used that. I thought I got to that first. The grass is green. <sighs> Oh, hold on. Let's. Oh, uh, his, he. He. See, he had it. The grass is pretty green in Eugene, or something like go. that. Yes. Yes, indeed. All right. So let's. Yes. I would have put some thought into this if I knew this is where we were headed. The <laughs> grass is pretty green in Mississippi. It doesn't rhyme. It doesn't. I know. I almost gave you the heads up, but I'd rather you know. Sometimes I'll I need it. one of those rhyming books. A rhyme dictionary. A rhyme dictionary. Right. The grass is pretty green. Over here at America's Most Watched Network. It doesn't rhyme. GP's not going anywhere. I'm not leaving. <laughs> no. I'd almost. love to know the story behind that. Either way, I found it absolutely hilarious. Let's get to the topic on the top of the show. We have had a wild week. Kansas blows a 16-point lead against UCF. Its largest blown lead in almost nine years. UCF... Gets its first win against an AP top five team in 13 years. That came against then ranked number four UConn back in 2011. I think that was the worst loss of the four. Houston losing at Iowa State is obviously nothing close to a bad loss and wasn't remotely shocking. Purdue losing at Nebraska is an understandable defeat, but you know they didn't cover themselves in glory in the loss. But Nebraska is working itself toward an NCAA tournament bid, and then Tennessee, which had been had won nine of its past 10 leading into that game against Mississippi state and Mississippi state had lost 21 straight games 
against teams ranked in the top five. Uh, its last top five win for the Bulldogs came in 2002. Um, just a great job by Chris Jans' team to get itself right and to overcome something that I didn't know would be the case with Tennessee. You know, Dalton Connect finally had a good game after some downtime. He had um, he had uh, 28. Zakai Ziegler had a really, really good game. I think he had 26 there. But Josh Hubbard's a really good player. So good on Mississippi State. Good on UCF for getting it. Uh, I would, I would, I know you've got Purdue still number one. I did see that here. Um, and again, as uh, GP Seth Davis and I were talking over text on Thursday about all this stuff, Parrish is building out his rankings based on like as if he was building out a tournament resume. So per bracketology, like Purdue should probably still be the number one overall C right now on January 12th. Uh, but I would lean closer to our colleague David Cobb, who has taken over for the power rankings this season. He has UConn number one. UConn was the only top five team to win this week. It also played on the road like the other four teams. It played a Xavier team that is not headed to the NCAA tournament. So as a snapshot of where we are right now in advance of this weekend, and I don't really feel like there's that much of a of a risk here because UConn's the next game. It's not in the final four and one, folks. GP, you know who UConn has this weekend? It's a home match against Georgetown. So uh, UConn highly, highly likely to win that game to get to 15-2. and two. I believe the Huskies will be your number one team on Monday. I would have UConn number one right now, and it would be a first. They have yet to hold – the rating champs have yet to hold the number one spot in the AP poll this season. I, I've never understood why it matters that much um, who lost most recently – um, that, that's not really anything we apply to, to to most other sports. For instance, if you are uh, comfortably in first place in the Eastern Conference standings of the NBA and you lose one game and the team that's in second place wins a game, um, if you're comfortably ahead of them, then you wake up the next morning, you look at the standings, you're still comfortably ahead of them, regardless of what happened last night. And though that's not apples to apples here, I really do think this is my point. If you forget about everything that happened, Thursday night, Wednesday night, Tuesday night, because all of these top five teams except UConn lost. But if you take all of them and then say, OK, let's just take a fresh look. Who's done the best so far this season? Who's got the best resume? Who's been most impressive so far this season? I think you're you're probably picking between Purdue and UConn, because though I, I'm a believer that you can do whatever you want to with Houston as long as Houston is undefeated because you can just point to the zero and the loss column and the incredible computer numbers and say that's my number one team in the country. Once Houston takes a loss, then I think you've got to evaluate the body of work as a one-loss team. And they are 14-1 and one overall, but just 4-1 and one in quadrant one. And this is the wilder thing, just 4-1 and one in the first two quadrants. They have nothing in quadrant two. So they're just 4-1 and one in the first two quadrants. That doesn't really compare to Purdue and UConn. If you want me to run you through it, right now they're both 14-2 and two overall. But Purdue is, I think, better, certainly in the win column. 6-2 in quadrant one, 9-2 in the first two quadrants. Whereas UConn is 5-2 and two in quadrant one, 7-2 and two in the first two quadrants. More interesting, Purdue has five wins over teams that are ranked in the top 20 of the net right now. Got wins over Arizona, Alabama, Tennessee, Illinois, and Marquette. Those are the teams ranked second, fifth, sixth, 11th, and 19th in the net. UConn only has one win over a top 30 team in the net. That's North Carolina at number nine. So no, UConn has five top 50 net wins. Uh, Purdue has five top 20 net wins. If it matters to you, and I don't think this should be the determining factor, but if it's just another thing you want to look at, Purdue is ahead of UConn in, in, in most of of the computers. So if I were turning in an AP ballot right now, I would have Purdue one, UConn two, but I recognize AP voters don't necessarily subscribe to across the board to, to what I just explained. And it is possible if not probable on Monday, UConn will be number one in the country, which yeah. is fine. I don't think it's crazy. It's not crazy to have UConn number one. It's just that if you were strictly looking at bodies of work right now, I, like if I did a blind resume thing and just put it out there, we made it into a poll. I think most people without looking at it would tell you Purdue has the best body of work in the country. What you said on, I don't know if it was halftime post game. I saw you on sports network Wednesday night. It must've been coming off of uh, these latest sets. Yeah. Cause it was, that's what it was. It was the, uh, it was a, the shorter show before you did the late night overnight uh, uh, episode of inside college basketball. And something we had talked about on the show here, 
Um, you said something to the effect of the gap between, you know, y- your top 10 to 15 teams and team that might be 40, 45th or 50th. I'm paraphrasing. Yeah. It's just smaller this season than it has been. I definitely think that's the case. I do think it's why we're seeing what we're seeing this week and in, in teams taking, you know, losses and ranked teams have been lo- losing with regularity. We got to get to, obviously we're going to get to what Gonzaga did on, on Friday, on Thursday night. Um, so we're getting a lot of that and we're seeing it here. Um, it's, it's coming in, in chunks. It's coming in clumps and it's uh, in some ways it's helping the likes of, I actually think, you know, from a perspective standpoint, it's probably helping the likes of say a, uh, a Purdue, maybe a Houston, when you've got all these other ranked teams going down. Not everyone is. You know, Carolina did go on the road and get a win against an NC State team that had not lost yet in ACC play, et cetera. But I think that the that the gap uh, has shrunk this season, and we get that every few years. I just didn't expect it to be this kind of year, GP, because we're still in the COVID bonus year, so these teams are older on average than we've seen in, you know, leading up to this for for many, many years. But you still got 22, 23, sometimes 24, 25 year olds on these rosters that are getting actual true legitimate minutes here. So I didn't necessarily see this one coming. And we may still get, I mean, I'm still very open to this because we've mentioned this as well. We could get to March and look and see that Purdue, UConn, and Houston, like our truly elite teams, or you know, a different combination of two or three different. We still may get there, but right now, um, yeah, there's there's certainly more parity, and then the distance between uh, your teams that are ranked and the teams that are not ranked and maybe not close to being ranked just isn't that large. Um, you would put into a, a, a document we we share information with uh, off air. Like uh, just sort of wondering, okay, we, we've already seen – how many teams have we seen be number one so far this season now? Purdue? Yes. Kansas. Kansas and Zona. UConn? No. Oh, that's it? It's gone. It was Kansas preseason. Then Purdue took it with Maui. Then Arizona took it after okay. Purdue got lo- dropped by Northwestern. And then Purdue regained it after Arizona lost to FAU and Purdue has had it here. Purdue – more likely than not to not retain it on Monday. So my question is, how many more teams that have not yet been number one to keep Kansas, Purdue, and Arizona out of there are we going to see get to number one? I think UConn will be number one on Monday. Uh, We are about halfway through this season in terms of a poll perspective. The last AP Top 25 poll will run the Monday after Selection Sunday. Um, My number is, I think my number is two. Like UConn will be one. And then I think we'll find a way for another team to get there. I I don't know if it can be Houston. We'll see. They're about to enter Big 12 play. Maybe Purdue gets it together. I think you can make the case for as few as one and probably as many as four. Four is a ton. I would lean on on two there. Um, I think UConn's highly likely to do it. And then... You know, what about an Auburn? Auburn's 13 and 2. Auburn won earlier this week against Texas AM. It's got a home game against LSU upcoming. Then it plays at Vandy next week and follows that up with a home game against Mississippi. So I think Auburn could be lingering in that discussion. Um, but I would I would I would say two. And if I'm gonna say two, I want to give you two teams. I'll I'll pick those two. I'll say UConn and Auburn, but there are other obviously nominees. Duke U, UNC, check on what UNC is doing here. So there's a there's a decent chance we get even more. I would say Two, UConn, obviously a, a candidate. UConn could be number one on Monday. And then Houston, I'll say Houston could still yeah. get there. Yeah, I could see Houston. We look up one Monday and Houston's number one team in the country. Kentucky is another one. I could just see them going on a, on a long run and and you look up and UK is number one in the country. But those are, those are, I'd say two. I bet you the numbers, we get two more. Yeah. And that would make a what? Total of five on the season? Five different schools. We broke the record a few years ago. I think it was eight. Someone, If anyone can fact check that in the live chat in real time, it was a few years ago we had the, uh, I believe it was the most schools to get to number one in one season. And if it wasn't that, it was the number one ranking changing over the most times. Those are two different uh, identifiers, but I think it was the most schools. If anyone knows in real time, I'll, uh, I'll mention it before we got out of the show. Not as telling me right now it was eight. Uh, he is actually mentioning it to me. So it was eight. I think that was two seasons ago. But we'll see. I think it'll be UConn. But either way, um, a tumultuous, noisy week. And I thought it was a pretty damn fun week in college hoops. Yeah. And if you look at UConn and Purdue this weekend, it'll be shocking if either one, they're both going to be heavy favorites in their games this weekend against not so great teams. So it'll be shocking if either one loses again this week. So they'll more or less take the resumes they currently have 
into Monday, and we'll see how AP voters handle that when they submit their ballots. Let's move on. Some rough injury news on Thursday out west. Just a lot of rough news out west. UCLA, USC, Gonzaga. We'll talk about all of it next. First, let's get a word from our partners. Dead leg, let's start with uh, USC. It was supposed to be a great final season in the Pac-12 for the Trojans. It's not. They're 8-8 eight and eight after Wednesday's loss at home to Washington State. And now Isaiah Collier, the five-star freshman, the top-ranked recruit uh, in the country, is going to be sidelined four to six weeks. He's got a hand injury. Let's start your whip around with that rough news for Andy Enfield's program. Yeah, well, uh, let's lead on USC and we'll we'll stick out west with uh, with the not great vibes happening out there on the on the left coast. So Collier enters this season, number one ranked prospect coming out of high school last season in the class of twenty three, and he has been good. But there was number one pick buzz around him. I would say that has fallen a bit. But then again, like totally different discussion like the top 10 discussion top five top three top you know top pick discussion for 24 has been all over the map here uh which brings a certain level of intrigue that i appreciate so he is now out which is obviously significant because usc is a major letdown and i you know i was way off on this team i had them second in the pack 12 top 10 top 15 level that is not the case they are hurtling toward uh nothingness i mean they're not they're not they're not headed to the nit right now and not having collier is is seriously damaging um ronnie james is yet to i believe ronnie james is yet to play more than 20 minutes in a game i don't know if this means that his his minutes are about to bump or not he may for all i know he may be on it's never been disclosed what his minutes restriction is on a per game basis or if he is even on one um but obviously no collier would seemingly open up a uh, window here for even more time for Bronny James. I don't even know if that's going to matter, Parrish. Um, USC is just, it's whatever. I think LeBron, I did not stay up to watch this game earlier this week against Washington State. I think LeBron even was like, you know what? I'm out. I think he might have left early, which I don't blame him. It is it is a bit of a bummer on this note. Like We'll get to UCLA and Gonzaga in just a second, but just not even having USC after it's had some good I mean, people that follow sport are aware of this. USC has had some good seasons as of late, made three straight tournaments. It was an elite eight a few years ago and has been a respectable program. That's been reliable. If you even go back to the 2020 season, GP, it was easily heading toward the tournament. And for this roster, which I thought was setting up to be its most talented to be eight and eight right now, losing at home by eight points to Wazoo earlier this season. Major disappointment. No Collier out four to six weeks. The question becomes, does he even ever play college basketball again? Because mm-hmm. USC is not in a position whatsoever. I mean, it's it's eight and eight and it's staring down three road games right now. It, it, you know, is it is he going to come back? And I mean, he's got something to come back for in this regard. He's not seen as a lock top five pick as far as I can tell right now. And if he were to come back and really, you know, surge usc to even you know respectability and get into the nit there actually might be value there uh he's out four to six weeks four to six weeks means he's back as early as valentine's day and back as late as march so we'll have to wait on that but yeah that's a uh that's a relatively big headline for a super underwhelming team yeah i thought about that as well like might it could it be so bad by the time he's healthy enough to play again that he has advised you don't need to be involved in this you don't need to risk suffering another injury remember that's the thing people were trying to talk zion into doing in his one year of college after he uh got hurt mid-season uh but he came back and played but he had something to play for like duke was a, a, a national championship contender if not the favorite in certain parts of that season to win the national championship i don't know that isaiah collier is going to have that type of thing uh, to play for and if you think you were wrong on usc buddy i had him pick to win the pac-12 so no. I didn't I didn't realize that. Oh, you didn't have yeah. Arizona? I had them ahead of Arizona. Oh, look at you. All right. Yeah. Well, I just sometimes I just say the wrong stuff, you know? You know, it just it, it happens. What do you what do you want? Well sometimes I just think sometimes I just think about the stuff incorrectly. <laughs> I had USC that on paper, it looked like the best team to me. Uh, on the court, it's a very average. Bronny, eight and eight. LeBron's nineteen and twenty. Yeah, it's true. The Lakers. They stink yeah. too. 
Yeah. Might need to get USC in an in-season tournament, it's see if they can turn it. things around. It's a bad situation all over LA hoops right now. Yeah, I didn't even consider the Lakers. I, you would know this better than I. That that's got to put Lakers are not even in top ten position right right in the conference. I think they are right on the. They're they're right around it. I mean, they're they're tenth. I mean, like believe it or not, they're tied for tenth right now with the Utah Jazz. They would be in the postseason at nineteen and twenty. Oh, with the with obviously the playing game there. Okay, well, yeah. um, that's the, that'll that'll do it for our NBA talk on this show. Um, yeah. All right, let's get to the losses on Thursday night. I'll start with Gonzaga here. Gonzaga played a competitive game. Adama Alpha Ball had a wonderful. If you watched it or you saw the highlight, he he took it. Uh, he took it left. Had an off balance shot, one handed right. Got fouled. Ball danced on the rim for a couple bounces. Goes in, drops. And then Santa Clara winds up winning the game and getting one of its, you know, this is not an elite Gonzaga team, obviously, but for Santa Clara and a regular season perspective, it is one of the more significant wins for that program because the, it had not, Santa Clara had not defeated Gonzaga since 2011, lost uh, 26 games in a row, and it was 2-48 and 48 in its previous 50 games against Gonzaga. Shouts to Herb Sendek. This team is now 3-0 and in the WCC. Adama Alpha Ball played wonderful. 77-76 win for the Broncos. And the fact that Gonzaga got a career-best 32 points from Anton Watson. He had six steals and nine boards. He played really well. Nemhard played relatively well. And they still couldn't get the win. Um... It's a tough scene for Gonzaga right now. Um, oh, by the way, Steve Nash was honored. I thought it was cool. Steve Nash apparently had not been to a Santa Clara game in many, many years. And just because of the nature of, hello, he played in the NBA for two decades, then was the coach of the Nets. He obviously doesn't have the upper, hasn't had the opportunity, uh, but currently he is uh, enjoying life uh, and was able to get over there. And the fact that he was in the building, a guy who took Santa Clara to three NCAA tournaments, was on hand and uh, and the Broncos won. I thought that was a, I thought that was a really, really cool thing. Santa Clara, by the way, one more bit of love for them. They've beaten four high majors this season. Now the wins are of varying quality, but it's four high majors. It matters if you're a WCC program. Stanford, Oregon, Washington State, Gonzaga have all been victim to Herb Sendek. Let's talk Gonzaga here, GP, though. Right now, Zags, resume is a mess. 11-5, and five, best wins, Syracuse, USC, UCLA, and yes, we are definitely getting to the Bruins in just a second here. Those three schools, their average Kempom ranking is 88th. And their combined record is 25 and 22. Obviously, Gonzaga, when we get to the WCC tournament, it's going to, and particularly the way that bracket sets up, so long as it really doesn't fall on its face in league play, it's, it, gets the, it gets the auto uh, bid, if you will, right into the WCC semi. So it only needs to win two games and the league is down. So it could get the auto bid. But from an at large perspective, Gonzaga shouldn't even rank last night, Parrish. But they're going to, that's going to end, oh, by the way, on Monday. Yeah. The first time in 144 weeks, 144, Gonzaga's going to drop out of the AP Top 25. Shouldn't have been ranked this week, but whatever. That's going to end. They shouldn't have been ranked the past two weeks. And they, you know what? They cruised on reputation a bit. Whatever. It happens. You can make the same uh, thing with FAU, who we'll get to, get to before we get out of the show. Um, I don't want to say whether you think Gonzaga's make the tournament or not, because I actually I don't think that's a totally fair question, like directly because of the automatic bid. Do you think Gonzaga will have an at-large resume on Selection Sunday? No. Yeah, I don't think so either. I mean, right, right now they're 0-4 in quadrant one, 2-5 and five in the first two quadrants with a fifth loss they're coming in quadrant two. So, you know, I, I what I've seen from Gonzaga so far this season suggests they're more likely to lose more questionable games in the WCC than they are to be able to get big wins in the WCC. I think, I think heading into... Their conference tournament, we're going to be saying they probably got to win it or Mark Few is going to miss the NCAA tournament for the first time ever. And, that, and the current poll question, we'll get to results in a little bit here. The current poll question right now is Gonzaga and Michigan State have the longest active streaks. It's a technicality. Kansas ended technically had it ended by the NCAA because of the sanctions in the offseason, whatever. So from a technical standpoint, Gonzaga and Michigan State have the longest active streaks. If you have not yet voted in the poll, please do. We'll get to the results here in a few. Uh, what do you think is going to happen? Both Sparty and Zags get in, or one or the other gets in and the other gets left out there. I agree with you. Gonzaga still has a road game at Kentucky on the schedule, which is now, which is the first time in I think a decade plus Gonzaga has been afforded a 
high profile non-conference road affair, uh, which was obviously much more common 15, 20, certainly 30 years ago. That is now a massive opportunity. We'll see if they can actually pull it off. That will give them some at large credibility if it, if Gonzaga can win it. But it's not just that Gonzaga cannot take uh, it, Gonzaga cannot take a non Q1 loss the rest of the season. Basically, it doesn't have that affordability anymore. And though it played a a tough game in Santa Clara. I thought it was more about Santa Clara being composed and Gonzaga not showing up ready to play. It does shine a big light on it. Um, um, well, it just Gonzaga's streak of NC of AP poll appearances should have snapped after they lost by double digits at home to San Diego State. Um, but AP voters kept them in there. You're, you're right. I, FAU, same deal, just in on reputation. I've had FAU out for a while. I've had San Diego's, I mean, I've had uh, Gonzaga out for a while. S- but there's no way for the AP poll to keep the Zags in there on Monday. So that streak will be over. Do you know who will then have the longest streak of AP poll appearances? Trivia time. Um, let me see if I can get this. And because I actually meant to I just ran out of time here. I'm wondering Gonzaga's streak of 143. I don't know the answer. I'm going to look this up. I might put it in next week's court report. I got to figure UCLA has got a longer streak and Duke has a longer streak, but I, I, this is a half guess. I feel like Gonzaga streak. That's about to end. Is oh, no, 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 no. I'm not talking all time. I just I mean know, like I'm just talking out loud. I feel yeah. like yours is about to, I think what's about to end. I think maybe, maybe the third longest ever, um, who currently has, I will say because of the nature of Purdue's non-conference play, I'm guessing it's Purdue. Am I right there? No, Purdue has been Purdue. In, Purdue has been in the AP Bowl 27 straight weeks, but that ranks one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, okay. eighth. It. it ranks eighth among right. active among three, active three streets. Three guesses. Uh, my next guess, because of the conference that it has played in, got to be Houston. 74 weeks. That is, uh, Houston will soon be at 75, and that will be the new longest active streak of AP Bowl appearances in the country. <laughs> massively impressive. Houston's about to go to 75 straight weeks. Kansas is about to go to 54 straight weeks. Tennessee's about to go to 49 straight weeks. Arizona's about to go to 47 straight weeks. All right. There we go. It puts the Gonzaga streak all, all that much more in, per, in perspective because it was nearly double of the current right. leader with Houston. That is, uh, that's outrageous. Um, UCLA, it's ass, okay? Woo. Has not a uh, parish. They got down by 50 and Utah. Utah is a good team. Craig Smith doing a wonderful job. I said the year that Craig Smith got hired, he was my pick on this show to be the most likely coach to be at the school of that entire carousel a couple of years ago, 10 years post. I still believe that I think he's a good coach, a really good fit there. I think Utah should be happy that they've got him because I think Utah is going to make its way into the tournament this year. That said, Winning by 50 is atrocious. UCLA is now 1-4 in, in the Pac-12. It has not been 1-4 in, in league play since the Pac-12, Pac-10, Pac-8 didn't even exist. John Wooden had not even gotten to UCLA. We're talking 1945-46. They were in the Pacific Coast Conference. It was also, That same year was also the last time that UCLA reached 10 losses this early on the calendar, man. It is a disaster. UCLA went into that game Thursday night having won seven straight against Utah by an average of double digits. And over the previous three seasons, UCLA's losses on average, eight total previous three seasons on average. It's already at six and 10. This is a complete disaster. And we did talk about UCLA on the show recently, so we don't have to uh, hit a coda here entirely. But there comes a time and there is a line that's crossed between we're having a bad season to this. This is an outright mutiny on the court. And whereas we have praised Cronin for some, for some, not all, for some of his willingness to be honest at the dais in these pressers, you can't tell me that hasn't had a negative effect. Like there are, there are ways for certain coaches in certain moments to motivate their teams with public criticism. And I think that can work, but it can also backlash on you. And to me, while there are other factors involved as well, Parrish, uh, he has taken multiple missteps, and now the Bruins are are an embarrassment, man. Like you, you're down 50 on the road against not even a surefire tournament team. I, I I could barely believe I was doing. I was watching other games, and then I go and check in, and I look, and UCLA is down 30 at one point, and I'm like, come on, man, what are we doing? Ten minutes later, it's a 50 point spread. Your thoughts on the quagmire in Westwood? Well, this is pretty obvious to me. Either they have quit on him or he has quit on them, but something has broken there. 
I mean, you you don't I, I don't care how young UCLA is. You shouldn't be down 50 to, to Utah. All right. Yeah. Nobody should ever be down 50 to Utah. And I mean that respectfully to Utah. I just mean you, it's a 40 minute basket. It's a 40 minute basketball game. You shouldn't be down 50. I mean, that's outrageous. Yeah. And so it's it's you know, if you look at once Mick got it going at Cincinnati and once you know, it, it was pretty consistently good. And since he's got it going at UCLA, it's been pretty consistently good. My point being, he doesn't have a lot of experience of like fighting through really bad stuff yeah. and trying to flip seasons. And I don't, I, you know, I, I say this as someone who believes Mick Cronin is one of the, like sincerely one of the, the better coaches in the country. I don't think there's any doubt he's mishandled this situation. I, I he he's lost this team, or either he's clocked out on them, but it's 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 a bad situation, and it it there's no there's nothing, um, there's no data that suggests it's it's about to get better. It, this could be a really long season for them. It really could. Um, if you're UCLA at this point, you, you're just hoping that uh, shows like this one are not bringing up your defeats um, and just worm your way to the end of the season and hope it doesn't get worse than this. But uh, it, frankly, if, if UCLA lost by 22, maybe even 30, wouldn't have brought it up on the show. You get down by as many as, as 50 and then try and salvage it uh, to the tune of a 44 <laughs> a 44 point loss against Houston. It was the second worst loss in program history. Uh, final was 90 to 44, excuse me, 46 points. They scored 44. They got doubled up. Um, the worst loss came in 97 against Stanford, which was a 48 point loss. Um, you're just, you know, when you enter that kind of historic territory uh, and losing by 46 points, I mean, it's, it's, it's bad, obviously. Uh, and and it, it's just like, you touched on this other team here, uh, but we're headed toward a place where we could have an NCAA tournament without some of the biggest brands in the sport. No yes. UCLA, no Gonzaga, mm -hmm. no Louisville, maybe no Michigan State. I'm not, I'm not betting against them yet, but they are one and four in the Big Ten after Thursday night's loss to Illinois. Mm -hmm. Michigan State's now one and four in the Big Ten for the first time ever under Tom Izzo. Yes, the bingo bango. Uh has not started one and four in the Big Ten since 88-89, 35 years ago. So UCLA hadn't gone one and four since the 40s. MSU uh since uh since the late 80s there. Illinois, by the way, just getting it done without Terrence Shannon Jr. continually. It's eleven and it's every time it's played an unranked team, it has it's one. And Terrence Shannon Jr., by the way, is due to have a hearing today um in court about his temporary restraining order we'll see whether that leads to anything or not in terms of his it, 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 on that real quick because okay. I, I went through this in in memphis when james wiseman got a temporary restraining order to also try to different, yeah just so we're clear it, that was a, a very different set of circumstances totally just, different set of circumstances yes. Understand. Yeah, yes, yeah. yes 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 but but he did try to get a temporary restraining order the, the thing i don't i've never really understood this is that terrence shannon wants to get a temporary restraining order so he can continue playing well there's no judge even if they grant you a temporary restraining order, the, the judge can't make you a, a basketball coach put you on a court. Right. You, like, you know, like if, if Illinois has decided you are not playing for us under these circumstances, there is no judge in the United States of America who can change Brad Underwood's rotation. So I don't understand what the point of it is. I like the way you put things sometimes, man. There's no judge. There's no judge who can tell Brad Underwood how he's going to use his bench minutes. Okay? Well, like I mean, like, I know, you're right. You're right. Yeah. Like it's, I just so I never understand like where people think this is going. They're they are thinking that it is going to a place where Brad Underwood and the Illinois administration might then lean on the courts to say, well, they said it's allowed. So since uh, since they decided to do this, we'll we'll roll with it. Whether they do, well, if they do, they then that's shameful. Yeah. Uh, that, we will see if that winds up actually leading to that point. But yes, it is by seeking this. Yes, it is opening Illinois up to some criticism, obviously. Yes. Um, uh, just one more sort of big uh, brand team that was ranked very highly in the preseason that is uh, not having the season most of us expected. Marquette lost again. Now two and three in the Big East. They went 17 and three in the Big East last season. They're going to have to go 15 and 0 the rest of the way. To match last season's record, that's going to be difficult. And oh, by the way, Isaiah Carr, you're not the only player injured this week. Sean Jones, torn ACL. He's not Tyler Kolick. He's not Cam Jones. 
but he was a rotation piece, and that's not ideal. Yeah, and strangely enough, Marquette was riding a 20-game home win streak in Big East play, which tied a league record. Uh, he thought maybe they were going to be able to set a conference uh, mark there. Did not happen. Credit to Pierre Brooks, who uh, who had 14 points in that game. He is averaging 16 a night and is definitely an unsung hero in the conference. So want to give uh, Butler's Brooks some love there. And on the flip side, Tyler Kolick, man. He has seven points in his last two games. Don't know what's going on there, but obviously that has to change drastically if Marquette's going to get back on uh, on track there. Not, you know, its resume is still respectable. It's better for the, yeah, I heard you say this on, on network as well. It's better for the Big East that Butler won the game right. because the Big East is now angling itself to a situation where it's got, you know, five teams, six teams really feeling legitimate. Now, as all this has happened, Providence has now hit a skid. Obviously, lost Bryce Hopkins. That's a major, major ding. So well, Providence was in that discussion before. It's still, it's at the table. We'll see if it can maintain that. Um, but yeah, Marquette losing on its home floor against Butler. That's um, that's that's something of a something of a wow there. And uh, and yeah, we'll see we'll see what uh, what can what can happen in the Big East over the weekend. Real quick on the poll that I alluded to earlier. Right now, Michigan State and Gonzaga, what's going to happen with these teams with the longest active streaks? Leading the poll, both missing the tournament at 32%. Um, both, uh, yeah, that's at 32%. Um, the, both getting in is, is the last choice at 18%. So it's relatively close, but the least amount of confidence that both get in, the most confidence that both mine don't get in. So uh, I think I'll go one way or another. One of them oh, makes let's it. Check, let's, for, you know, let's just, why not? Let's do it. I will say... I would say Zags in by auto via auto bid and Michigan State out. And I think that is now second in the poll. Zags in Michigan State out. Would you I think if they both get in, it'll be like that. If they both get in, it'll be Michigan State at large, just on the right side of the bubble. Zags win the automatic bid at the WCC. But I think the more likely scenario, I would say one's in, one's out. And at this point, I think Michigan State is going to prove to be the better team between the two, mm -hmm. but Gonzaga might have a better chance of making the tournament just because it's so much easier to get that auto bid out of the WCC than it would be for the Spartans to try to get that that Big Ten auto bid. I do, I do agree with you. A couple more quick head headlines before we pick the games. Uh, in the Big Ten, Wisconsin only has one loss since November 14th. It's 4-0 in the league and just one at Ohio State. So it is now firmly, we talked about that on our recent show, who's going to be that team right behind Purdue. Right now, it is clearly Wisconsin, no doubt about it. Um, FAU on Thursday night, dodged one, won at Tulane. Uh, frankly, there were a couple fouls on FAU late that did get called, and then and then there was a foul against Elijah Martin when he was shooting a three. And it's one him. of those, and that was one of those fouls where it's not even really debatable, is it? Like everybody acknowledges, That's like it. they fouled him. He got his hand. It, yeah. it wasn't it wasn't an egregious foul, but he got his hand. So it, uh, and it was a desperation three. FAU came really close to losing, uh, but there was a hack on Vlad Golden that didn't get called. Whatever. Um, Tulane's lost fifty three straight games against AP ranked opponents. Uh, FAU got its first road win of the season. It had 11 of those last season, by the way. Won 11 times on the road. FAU just got road win number one on January 11th. Um, FAU now uh, trying to stabilize itself. Um, two more. One, we, if, if we're going to poke fun when they're bad, I'm going to give them a little shine here. Louisville went down to Miami and won this week. So credit to Kenny Payne and the Cardinals. That's obviously a horrendous loss for the Hurricanes. That is a seed line loss maybe a double frankly because of that um but cr credit to louisville for getting the win and then it's an nit seed <laughs> it's it's a really bad one there um but hey louisville got it done so credit to the cards and then uh in a new one here in a semi semi-regular feature on the podcast it's what the hell's going on at michigan oh my god <laughs> suspended its best player doug mcdaniel but in a twist He's only suspended for the road games. So the school announced he would be suspended uh, until further notice. McDaniel then went on social media and clarified that he is suspended. So we're going to take McDaniel's word for it. He's suspended for the next six road games. Can play at home, though. So uh, Wolverines are 6-10 and 10 after losing to Maryland earlier this week. They are obviously on a road to nowhere. And their best player will be featured at home, but not allowed to travel with the team on the road. That's all the details I can give you. How many things have happened at Michigan since Jawan Howard became the head coach that you go, Oh wow. I've never seen that before. Or, or I almost never see that either, either or like, yeah, exactly. Okay. Like slapped an assistant on a handshake line. Never seen that before. Um, is on the bench, but not coaching. 
Never seen that before. Uh, is is taking his leading scorer and said you can play home games but not road games. Never seen that before. It's just all weird. There's a lot of weird stuff going on there. A lot of weird stuff going on at Michigan. And some care. A lot probably don't give a damn right now because their football team just won the national championship four days ago. But it certainly seems like we are heading toward uh, a change in coach once we get to March. Uh, it is a completely lost season for the Wolverines. You Oh, you're thinking John Howard's in his last season as coach of the Wolverines. I would say that is more likely than not at this stage of the season, yes. I would say yes. I would think, yeah. I did say to somebody, like in a text, I can't really remember who I was texting with, but I was like, I don't know that he'll be, oh, I, I remember, I'm not going to say who I was texting with, but I told this person, I don't know that he'll be the coach there in two years. Yeah. I mean, yeah. at a certain point, it's it's been going the wrong way for a minute here. Um, yeah, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not feeling it. Are you ready for the final four and one presented by FanDuel Sportsbook? You know I am, baby. After two weeks away, it's After the, last week when I made picks on a gondola, then I went one and four. Of it's the, it's going to be the final four and one presented by FanDuel Sportsbook. Make every moment more. We'll do that next. But first, one more word from our partners. Out there, there are two colossal beings, both forces of nature in their own regard. But in here, as soon as the shoot bursts open, the duality of man and beast begins to fade. This is the PBR on CBS Sports Network. It's the final four and one presented by FanDuel Sportsbook. Make every moment more. Have you seen our updated records? Of course I have. We have a Google Doc that we both referenced before we do the show. I know, but I don't know if I don't know how closely you looked at it. I looked at it real closely. What it says is I'm 25, 20, and one after going two and three last week and then missing the college football playoff title game. You went one and four and also missed the college football playoff title game. Yes. You're 23, 22, and one. Yeah. That means I have what is being described. Mm. As an insurmountable lead. This happened last year, and then what happened? I'm just. I don't remember. I don't live in the past. You sound like somebody living in the past. If we don't learn from the past, we're doomed to re repeat our mistakes. Something like that, right? I think that was Plato. Yeah, it was either Plato or Tony Bennett. <laughs> Tony Bennett. Yeah. Yeah, he said that. That's true. Yeah. After they lost he the won! UMBC. After he lost the UMBC. That's what he said. Game one, Saturday, 1 p.m. Eastern. St. John's at number 22 Creighton inside the Nick Nolte Center. You can watch it on Fox. Kim Pom has a Creighton minus eight. Did I get a Nick Nolte in there? He's born in Omaha, Nebraska, according to Wikipedia. Yeah, I knew. I was, I was about to say, you went to, you went to Wikipedia and just brought up Omaha and looked famous people, didn't you? That's exactly right. Exactly what just happened. And then I saw Nick Nolte and I said, oh, buddy, he's going to have a basketball arena named after him. Presented by FanDuel Sportsbook. Last time you watched Blue Chips was when? Oh, God, a kid. When I was a kid. Yeah, I'm going to say, I'm gonna but say like be, 98. But because of, uh, it was a big deal, obviously, because of, because yeah. Penny was in it. Yeah. And that was like fresh out of college and Penny was in it. So um, I was at the, like, you know, it was one of those things. There was like a premiere in Memphis. And yeah, I was at one of those types of deals. But I haven't seen it in probably 30 years. So, like, for and for those who are not around when Blue Chips came out, just imagine, I, I guess he just got injured, so it's not a great example, but, like, to a comparison, like, you couldn't even think of it. Imagine, like, Isaiah Collier or Zach Eady coming out of college and then having, you know, a viable role in a, in a highly hyped sports movie. Like, right. it's just a different, it, different, and then Shaq was obviously, a, it's a different deal. Like, it's just different sports environment media environment altogether just uh different uh from a different era there um st john's at creighton 22nd rank creighton i think you said the line was eight for ken palm right creighton minus eight johnny's doing well patino said his team can't stop going to the buffet you see that quote earlier this <laughs> my, my guys can't stop going to the buffet providence plays like they like they're starving or they haven't eaten in a week Although I maintain, if you've got a team that hasn't eaten in a week, they're going to be famished and won't have the energy to yeah, play. Yeah, they're going to have no energy. Whatever. Whatever. I want my team to play like they haven't eaten since breakfast. Exactly. <laughs> I had a, had, a, had, a, had a nice little meal, a couple eggs, bacon, pancakes, strong side of OJ, and uh, you got a little motivation to you. Yeah, you got a little uh, grumble in the tummy, but whatever. I'll I tell you what, I was in a Delta Sky Club the other day. 
Oh. And I couldn't find this little like the, the Coke Zero machine. Oh, I just couldn't God. find it. And I myself was famished. Yeah. And so uh, I pour. I said, you know what? I don't usually do this. This is not something I normally do. But I'm going to pour me some vitamin C. I'm going to have me a nice glass of orange juice. I tell you what, a nice cold glass of orange juice is great. Oh, of course, man. I go I go OJ in the morning at least three, four times a week. I don't feel like I do that enough. Oh, I feel stuff. like I should do that more, man. I, li- I like orange juice. You know what's, you know what's actually good? Hmm. Orange mango tango. You ever had that? Uh, it's um, what's his name? The guy uh, Newman's. That's the dressing. Paul Newman's company. Orange mango tango. Seek it out if you haven't. Good stuff. A little, sh- little sugary. A little, get a little ice in there. Water it down a little bit. Gives you a nice little kick in the morning. It's a freebie for you right there. I'll take Creighton to cover the eight. You, you can't give Rick Pitino eight points. Are you out of your mind? I'm, I'm about to. Have you lost your mind? No. Have you misplaced your mind? I got a lead to surmount. So let's go. St. John's building a resume. Now, uh, six and three in the first two quadrants. They do have that quadrant three loss. That's problematic. But uh, St. John, I could see St. John's playing their way into the top 25 and one at some point this season. I'm taking Rick Patino. Hold on, hold on. If, if, if Rick Patino, if they win outright straight up, are they going top 25 and one on Sunday? As always, I'll have to I'll have to take a fresh, I'll have to take a fresh look at that on Sunday morning, dead leg. I can't commit to anything like that on a Friday morning. I can't start telling you what Sunday's going to look like on a Friday morning. Inside the number, okay. Sounds I good. will tell you, they are on the list of teams that are under consideration, and obviously, going to Omaha and winning in a building named after Nick Nolte would be a step in in the right uh, direction. Game two, Saturday, two p.m. Eastern. Number 19, San Diego State at New Mexico inside the Heisenberg. You can watch it on CBS. That's America's most watched network. It's the network of stars. Just so we're clear on this, this is the pit. Harris tries to go same exact thing. So that is why it's simply the Heisenberg, not the Heisenberg Center, not the Heisenberg Arena, not Heisenberg Spectrum. It's just the Heisenberg. That's right. Good. The pit and the Heisenberg. That's right. Yeah. Uh... Kim Bomb has it San Diego State minus one. My Aztecs, slight underdog, uh, slight favorites Aztecs. on the road. Aztecs. Aztecs. Ah, see this one? You know what it is? It's a classic. Classic right here. Wrong team favorite situation. Oh, wow. Wrong team favorite situation. You got the Lobos. They've lost two of their past three. Those are both roadies, though. Recent home conquests include a 17 point victory over a bad Wyoming team. A 13-point win over a UC Irvine team that very well may come to represent the Big West when we get to the NCAA tournament. Uh, New Mexico has yet to lose at home this season. It's done well at home as of late in general uh, under Richard Pitino. They did take a couple L's last season, but they were a good squad last season, and it's carried over. Absolutely. I wonder if the – see, we're doing Ken Palm because we're a day before, but when the fan duel line comes out on Saturday, I think New Mexico is going to be uh, – Give it a point here. I will take the Lobos plus one per Ken Palm in this one. I love that this game's on CBS. The Mountain West is one of the more fun leagues this season. And these are two likely, certainly possible NCAA tournament teams. Combined records right now, 27 and five. New Mexico has dropped two of three. Both of them on the road, though. Just lost at UNLV. I can't pick against my Aztecs. I respect home court advantage. I respect the Heisenberg. I respect what Richard Pitino has done there. I just realized I have an opportunity right now to pick Pitinos in in, in game one and game oh, two. You've already you have already decided. I'm afraid uh, I'm afraid you missed that boat. Damn it! <laughs> oh, I just can't pick against my Aztecs. Yeah, I hate it when I have a Pitino against an Aztec because it pulls my heart in different directions. Classic battle. But I will take a. I'm going to take my Aztecs as, as slight favorites on the road. Game three. Saturday, 2 p.m. Eastern, number nine, Oklahoma, at number three, Kansas, inside TJ Gasnola Fieldhouse. Uh, You can watch it on ESPN+. Plus. Oh, you better sign in. You better sign in. Kim Fom has it, Kansas minus four. Yes, this is the – there are only two ranked on ranks this week. The first one was BYU-Baylor. That was on the plus. And, yes, this one is on the plus. These games get picked in the preseason in terms of what goes to ESPN Plus and the anticipation, obviously, in October or whenever they decided was that Oklahoma would not be a top 10 team at the time of the game. Uh, so here we have it. Uh, both these com- teams coming off a loss here. You said four? 
Kansas minus four. And to your point, unlike college football, like college football, they build the schedules like for television, like two weeks before the games or less than two weeks. They're like, okay, hey, now Oklahoma's in the top 10 and Kansas is in the top 10. We're going to put this on ESPN. But in basketball, these things are decided like in July or August. So whatever, whatever, if they decide in July or August or whenever your game's on ESPN Plus, like Oklahoma and Kansas could literally both be undefeated right now, ranked number one and number two, and this game's on ESPN Plus. This stuff is decided months ago. Yeah, and uh, and obviously, you know, they wouldn't have anticipated Baylor would have been a top ten team in the metrics most of the season, and that uh, lo and behold, that's what happened. It was a good game. This one has a chance to be a good game as well. Kansas right now nineteenth at, uh, at old uh, KenPom dot com. Oklahoma twentieth. Oklahoma's thirteen and two. Kansas is thirteen and two. These teams have uh, have played a couple of good ones at Fog Allen Fieldhouse over the years, most notably the epic Buddy Heald game, Triple OT. Oh, gosh, was that now six, seven years ago already? Aye, aye, aye. Um, KU, coming off the loss against UCF, I would trust this team and Bill Self in this spot significantly, particularly after the way that it played and the lead that it gave up. Uh, Porter Moser's team has done well for itself, and defensively, it is legitimate. I almost wonder if uh, if it can keep Kansas under can it keep Kansas under seventy in this spot? I don't think so. If it can, then I think it's got a shot. But I don't think it'll quite get there. I do expect a defensive battle overall. Can we see? Can we see, like I, I genuinely like? Can we? See, can Elmarker Jackson have a halfway decent game here? Like he's they got to play him, but zero. We, we talked. I know no points earlier this week. It's not good. Um, we talked about half joking, half serious. Like Kansas, if if if, if it was four and four hoops, might be the best team in the country because they got a great foot one through four. At some point, as self and people on that staff, any coach will tell you, like you do need games where either your fourth best player, your fifth best player, your first guy or second guy off the bench, they just give you something. It is it is so immense to season long momentum, team morale to not have to rely on the same one, two or three guys every single game. Like for fans of these teams, you're aware of this. Like you, when you watch a game, okay, well, you know what? Finally, after three, five, seven game cold spell, we finally got a good one game out of that guy. Can you get that out of Jackson or Johnny, you know, Johnny Furphy? Who's that, who's that going to be? Nick Timberlake. Are we going to get that in this game? I think, I think there's a halfway decent chance. I will take, I'll take Kansas here, Parrish. I just, uh, coming off that loss, home, four is not a huge number. Uh, yeah, I'll go. I'll go Jayhawks. I'll even give you a score here. I'll say Jayhawks win 74 66. Like in the preseason, we talked about Kansas, and it was like, okay, at the two, man, who are you going to put on the bench? A Marco Jackson or Nick Timberlake? Now it's like, man, who are you going to take off the bench? Because they both probably belong on there. Like it's not just that Elmar, El Marco Jackson scored zero last game, he's played 46 minutes in the past two games. And scored zero points in 46 minutes. Mm. I, I, like, that seems almost impossible. And, yeah. and like, for a, for a scoring guard, four shots in 46 minutes? That's, Dewan Harris isn't a score first point guard. That's, right. Four yeah. shots in 46 minutes and zero points in both games? What? I, I went and looked it up last night just because we keep talking about, man, this is a four-man team. Like, who's their fifth player? And, like, there's a million different ways to – frame that but just one way i went and looked at everybody else in the top 10's fifth leading score just to see what that is what that looks like okay for kansas the fifth leading score right now is johnny furphy he's averaging 5.6 points per game mm -hmm. Purdue's fifth leading score is averaging 7.5 houston 7.5 yukon's 9.7 tennessee's 8.1 kentucky's 11.9 nice. north carolina 7.1 arizona 11.1 oh. oklahoma 8.8 .8, illinois 7.6 it is true that no team in the top 10 of the ap poll has a fifth leading score doing less uh, than the kansas has and with yeah. its fifth leading score. I'll up to that might be that might be a little Norlander nugget and note in next week's court report. That's a good little that's a good one. So uh, send that. Oh, to hey, I'll just write it for you if you want me to. <laughs> you're not you're not getting a co byline on a 14 minute read, damn you! Not gonna happen. No shot. But I'll give you credit for it in the in the court report nonetheless. Uh, by the way, before we pick the next game, Saturday is your really good matchup. Uh, I got to go to a streaming special. You got this, and obviously NFL playoffs get going. Uh, here is your reminder. I'm sure people are aware, but just in case. Chiefs Dolphins, 
arguably the best matchup of the of the NFL Wild Card Weekend. That is Peacock only. We have a Peacock only situation for the NFL playoffs on Saturday night. If you do not have a subscription, you cannot watch the game. That is your Friday heads up. If you have a Peacock subscription, I do. Yeah. Um, Bupkis, pretty good. There we go. Okay, it's pretty good. All it's right. a Pete Davidson like sitcom almost. Pretty good. Okay, there we go. Attitude. I'm taking Kansas minus four. Game four, Saturday, 6 p.m. Eastern. Number two, Houston at TCU inside Desmond Bain Arena. You can watch it on ESPN. Kim Palm has it Houston minus seven. I believe Paris just picked the same game with me as game three, which I endorse because he is the one that instituted his own rule for game three. We have a rare same game pick situation. Just want to remind our audience of that. Game four, TCU, Houston minus seven here. This is a home game for TCU. Horn Frogs, maybe the uh, maybe the most I don't want to say overlooked, but you know they they had a high profile game last weekend. I guess um, they're twelve and three. I, my point is this: they played a non conference schedule, which is just atrocious, man. Like dotted with sub two fifty teams all over the map. But they have so many opportunities in the Big Twelve that they got to take advantage, and this is where you got to do it, man. Because right now their best wins: Arizona State. And Oklahoma. Now, Oklahoma was a good win, but it's not enough. You got to win against Houston because it's Oklahoma is the only top 100 win right now. I will take TCU to win this. I I like Houston, kind of like Kansas, to come off the loss and get the win. Close one here. Um, so I'll say, unfortunately, in back-to-back -back weekends for the Horned Frogs, they wind up taking a close loss. But, you know, Maybe the two best teams in the in the league that uh, that could be the fate there with KU last weekend and now Houston. I got Houston to win, but if you're telling me that number is seven, nah, Horn Frogs cover that number. Yeah, eleven of their games right now have been outside of the first two quadrants. They've only played four games inside the first two quadrants. They're one and three. Now all of that is in quadrant one, but they are one and three in the first two quadrants. On the other hand, they just beat Oklahoma, which is ranked ninth in the AP poll right now. They've got Kansas at home, or or Houston at home, rather. They've got an opportunity to get two wins over top 10 teams in a four-day span. It's a big spot inside Desmond Bain Arena. It's a huge spot. Who's your pick? I think the number's too big. Give me TCU plus seven. I think that's our first game. No, second game we agreed on because you, uh, you agreed with me on KU. All right. Uh, other games to know. Friday night, talk Mountain West. Boise State at Nevada. 10.30 Eastern FS, FS1. It's your one really good game on Friday night. It's a couple of 2-0 and Mountain West teams. A Boise win here for me in the moment. That makes the Mountain West a six-bid league in the moment. In the moment. If they can win at Nevada, we'll see on that. That's a quality, quality matchup. Saturday, other games to keep an eye on in chronological order. Noon, you got Seton Hall, which is 4-1 and in the Big East. 11-5 overall. Butler is also 11-5. So Seton Hall at Butler on at noon on Saturday. Uh, winner of that one's going to come out feeling relatively fantastic uh, by mid-January there. 2 o'clock Eastern, ESPN, Kentucky at Texas A&M. A&M is 9-6. and six. Feels like borderline desperation time for Buzz Williams' team. Got a home court advantage situation. Need to take advantage of that. 4 o'clock Eastern, ESPN 2, 12-3 Kansas State at 13-2 and two Texas Tech. I just think this is a fun one. Um, I'm a little foggy on the futures of both of these teams in terms of where they rank in the Big 12 hierarchy, but they got really good records to this point. And for Grant McCaslin and Texas Tech, off to a really good start. 14-2, and two, if they're that come Sunday night, we might have something to talk about. 6 o'clock Eastern, Arizona plays at Washington State. Mentioned previously this week that Gonzaga at Santa Clara felt a little bit slippery. This also feels a little bit slippery. Unfortunately, it is on Pac-12 Network. Someone send us a carrier pigeon. Let us know how that one turned out. Six Eastern for that one on Saturday. Two more on Saturday before we get to our N1 game. Eight o'clock. Just a good Big 12 matchup, man. They're coming down the assembly line one after another after another. 12-3 and three Cincinnati at 13-2 and two Baylor. Cincinnati probably should have beat Texas at home earlier this week, and they let it slip away with Max Aismas hitting the game winner. Dylan DeSue having one of the best games of his career. Now let's see how Cincinnati responds. A week removed from going on the road and beating BYU. Can it beat another Big 12 B team in Baylor? And then 8.30 Eastern SEC Network, Alabama, a top 10 team per multiple predictive metrics, is on the road against a Mississippi State team that sure sure as hell is uh, is building itself into a, a pretty nice a pretty nice team here. And, and Chris Jans has done a good job uh, coaching that group. So those are some other games to know. Our and one, 
Saturday, noon Eastern on ESPN2. They're going to play this one on Dominique Wilkins' court. Dominique Wilkins has one of my 10 favorite sports nicknames of all time. The What was it, GP? Dominique Wilkins? Yep. Remember, his, what was his nickname? The Italian Stallion. Yeah, we had some good momentum there. Just the human highlight film, man. Yeah. The Italian Stallion. I think Dominique Wilkins was the Italian oh, Stallion. Hold on, let's do a quick. Dominique Wilkins, where was he born? I'm gonna say he was. He went to Georgia. I'm gonna say he was born in Georgia, but I don't. I don't have that. Dominique Wilkins, uh, bo born in France. Told you. <laughs> well, you did not. You had him in Italy. Born in born in Paris. How about that? I know. Yeah, no. I I think Dominique Wilkins. I think you had the French connection. You'd have had something, but you didn't have that. I think people used to call him the Greek freak. All right, Dominique Wilkins Court is the host to this game. Human highlight film, one of the best sports nicknames of all time. Number five, Tennessee is at Georgia. And I picked this game because Georgia, did you know, Georgia right now peeled off 10 straight victories under Mike White. This was a two and three team on November 23rd. It is now a 12 and three team, two and zero oh in the SEC. as a win at Missouri and just beat Arkansas earlier this week. So Georgia's got a little something going here, but Ken Palm has this Tennessee minus seven on the road at Stegman Coliseum on Dominique Wilkins court. Who you got? Georgia zero, zero in quadrant one. They haven't even played a game like this Not all season. Quad one game yet. How about that? Okay. Yeah. They haven't played nothing like this yet. Um, I think Tennessee wins, but I think it's closer than that. I'll take Georgia plus the points at home. Yep. Uh, in the spirit of, not changing uh, to to try and you know adjust the record and, and shorten your lead. I always pick these before the segment, and I do have Georgia. Seven's a lot for Tennessee on the road here, and it hasn't been a good team on the road this season. Uh, so Georgia getting seven at home, I'll take them. But this does feel like I picked this one because of Georgia's win streak, but also this feels like one of those games where I could see Tennessee winning by 23, by 13. By 10, by 3, even Georgia winning by as many as 6 or 7. Just feels like there's a decent amount of variance with this one. But a Georgia win for Mike White's team, uh, then that uh, an outright win would uh, would maybe have starting people to, to sit up and look around here. He's in year 2, and uh, he left Florida with the idea that he could get that uh, program in Athens going the way that he did Gainesville. Here's a huge chance, and as GP said, the first quad one opportunity. I feel like that's a podcast. Uh, I'm pretty sure it is. Oh, you know what though? Before we get out of here, hmm. can we? Can we? We did not. We sometimes we talk about this off air, but I figured I thought about it during the show and as we were doing the final four and one. Um, maybe you can't do this though. Uh, NFL playoff weekend here, yeah. And the Sunday schedule is lacking, and there are no games that are happening certainly in the evening that are going to make it worth it. And that's the Packers. Like that's a huge NFL game. Um. Our, our listeners have certainly appreciated the Saturday stuff. Do you want to slash can you? Do you want to just everything of relevance that's going down is happening Saturday and we could free up our Sunday. Um, there's Memphis at Wichita State on Sunday, but I don't feel like that's worth it. But, so I don't know if you can or not. I am willing to do a late night Saturday show and recap whatever the hell goes down. Uh, that gets a pretty decent live audience, but I don't even know if you're free. So I'm, I'm asking you right now on the live show. I will talk to you again on Sunday. Okay. <laughs> Okay, we'll, we'll talk to you. We'll talk to you on Sunday then. Right. Shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Terry MF and Teagle. Legend. Shouts to Huck. Shouts to Larnell. Shouts to the Italian stallion, Dominique Wilkins. If you haven't subscribed to the Iron College Basketball Podcast, you could do that anywhere you subscribe to podcasts, including Apple and Spotify. There's more of us than there are of them. That should be reflected in the comments. So make sure you're doing that, and we'll talk to you again soon. Till then, take care.